welcome to the No Dunks Podcast on the Athletic Network, a fine network. It's Thursday, March 14th, 2024. I'm J.E. Skeets here in the Classic Factory, and alongside me, as always, Tass Mellis. Podcast listeners, this is for you. Next to him, it's the bearded one, my top shot hot boy, Trey Kirby. Hey-o! hey And last but not least, over yonder, making the magic happen all week long, it's Eshua Kid. How y'all doing? What's hey. up, Esh? Doing great. Shout out to the stream team joining us live right now on YouTube. Hit that like button and subscribe. Coming up later today, for all you Survivor fans, a new No Buffs, breaking down last night's episode three, which ended a little weird, but TK and I will break down this episode at about 1 p.m. Eastern. Go search for No Buffs on YouTube or wherever you download and listen to podcasts. But let's get into the hoops, and I got some good news. We had wedgie number 46 last night, and we had Devlin... And Jack Armstrong on the call. And saved by IQ to Kelly. Linick into the front court. To Mora. And what do we have here, Jack? That's a wedgie, man. A wedgie. Shout out to Taz and Skeets and the No Dunks podcast. And the original basketball Jones in it is Toronto. Right here. Wow, a little Basketball Jones callback there from Devlin. Hey, throw Trey Kirby's in name next time. Come on, buddy. I wasn't going to say it. (laughs) I got you. Uh, But we love to hear that anyway from Devlin. I like how Jack says Wedgie, too. That was a nice one, too. What do we have here, Jack? A Wedgie. (laughs) That's a beautiful voice. Nice combo. What do we have here, Jack? (laughs) So Ivy picks up Wedgie 46 with the block on Nora in a Pistons win for you. (laughs) Were you conflicted? Raptors lose. But hey, your Pistons in the nut dozen. Bowl standings win. Right. No, I want the Raptors to get that top six pick. The more losses, the better. Oh, true, true, true. We'll get into that game. <laughs> Will we? <laughs> I don't know. Not much. Know. Not much. No. Let's start with a banger from last night with his team. DeMar DeRozan's 46 points lead the Bulls past the Pacers in overtime. Hell of a shot from DeRozan at the end of regulation. The baseline play fading with like two seconds to go splashes it to get the Bulls into overtime, and then he was pretty damn good in that uh, extra period. He was great in overtime as well. I let out a yes when he hit the jumper on the baseline. A great play and a great game. I gave it five stars on BoxedScore.com. Okay. <laughs> Nine ties, 19 lead changes in the fourth quarter, five ties and 10 lead changes. Big shots on both sides. I thought it was going to be over when Miles Turner hit back-to-back yeah. threes. First one tied the game up. Next possession hit another one to put him up three with 55 seconds left. Uh, Gain Bridgefield's house was going crazy. It was so loud in there. But on the other end, the Bulls got some nice plays. You know, smart move by the Pacers to foul up three. DeRozan goes to the line, knocks down the first one. Then a clutch miss. I think it was his first missed free throw of the game at that point. Obi Toppin tips it way out. Right. And then a good call by Billy Donovan. He ran a play where Io DeSumo screens Pascal Siakam, who was guarding DeMar DeRozan. That left TJ McConnell to switch on DeRozan. McConnell was right there. But he doesn't have the size to contest DeRozan, who just shoots jumpers over people. That's kind of his game. Another clutch game for the Bulls. Their 38th of the season. 23rd clutch win of the season. That's tied for first with Denver. They are play-in ready right now. (laughs) (laughs) What a game. I mean, this was very entertaining. Some huge shots. Some huge defensive plays. You know, the the Siakam chase down block. And then he flips on his back and lands on Kobe White. Hopefully he's okay. Obviously had to leave the game. But Mm -hmm. some uh, just entertaining basketball in this one. Yeah, the game story could have been Pascal Siakam's block there. The chase down block. It wasn't quite an Anthony Edwards chase down block where he hit his head on the rim, but it was a chase down block with 10 seconds left where they were up one, then they go hit two free throws, then the eternal question. Do you foul to send the guy to the line, shoot two free throws, instead of letting him shoot the three? So they fouled DeMar DeRozan, and unfortunately it was Aaron Neesmith who did the best job possible all game long under Mario Rosen, who had, who had a good game, but that was their guy. He fouls out, so he's not around for overtime when DeMar goes off. Mm. And, yeah, then DeRo- DeRozan hits the first. The Pacers just ain't tall enough. Uh, they had they had all their bigs out there. They had them all there in, in Miles Turner. Um, but Obi Toppin just couldn't do it. Man. He just jumped t- too high. <laughs> he just tipped it to the side. Yeah. If he really had just tipped it you up. Know. As high as you up can. or back, yeah. I understand. He, yeah. he he did try, and it wasn't a bad move. He knocked it out of bounds. Uh, but then you get De- uh, DeRozan where he hits his shots. That baseline jumper, 
Apparently, according to the stats, he's 55% from that right baseline mid-range spot. All right, Kirk Goldsberry. Yeah, that's a decent <laughs> that's a decent number. And yeah, you missed. And then he went off, obviously, in overtime where he had nine. And he had free, 15 free throws in the game that he hit. A lot of points. A lot of yeah. points that guy. DeRozan, 15 of 24 from the field, 15 of 17 at the line. He had nine boards, two steals. He played a lot of minutes. Game high, 44 minutes there, it going to overtime. According to Statitudes, DeRozan, second oldest player in NBA history to make at least 15 field goals. And 15 free throws in a game, trailing only Carl Malone, who was just a little bit older when he did it. Um, Drozen was special. I thought some big plays by some of the other guys in overtime for your Bulls, TK. Uh, Vucci, baby, hit a big, like, turnaround jumper yeah, he in overtime. He was like, you know, I heard the Bulls broadcast, get up on Miles Turner, man, what are you doing? <laughs> but that was a big shot. Then you had Io blowing by Halliburton for that layup because Siakam and the Pacers, like, they were like anybody but DeRozan. He was like face guarding him like mm-hmm. 40 feet away from the net. And DeRozan's like, somebody else is going to have to do something here. Io took it at Halliburton, laid it in. I thought that was nice. And then finally, really late with like 24 seconds to go, uh, again, get the ball out of DeRozan's hands. He gets it to Caruso. And he found, I guess it was Tory Craig underneath the hoop, sort of was looking away, sort of looking at Vooch, found Craig laid it in so all three of those guys making you know, at least timely plays to help out DeRozan who did the heavy lifting Bulls last five wins I think they're five and they must be five and two in their last seven if I'm thinking right their last five wins though they won the two overtime game against Cleveland DeRozan fouled on a three at the end of regulation makes all three free throws to go into OT where they ended up winning they had the 22 point comeback win against the Kings where DeRozan outscored Sacramento 19 to 16 in the fourth quarter then they beat the Jazz by two DeRozan 17 in the fourth quarter Then they beat the Warriors by three. DeRozan makes two shots in the final minute, both to take the lead and then ices the game at the line with two free throws. This guy has money. (laughs) Yes. We'll we'll get into some uh, NBA award predictions or look at the front runners uh, a little bit later in the show. We'll even talk about the clutch player of the year. And Mm. I think the odds even flipped over the last 24 hours or after this performance. A lot of the odds I saw had Curry as the favorite until what DeRozan did last night, and now DeRozan is the favorite uh, when you're looking at the books makers there for a clutch player of the year, which is an award <laughs> that I yeah, sometimes forget right. about. <laughs> and it's voted on, but it's... Yeah. It, yeah, but people just look at the numbers. I think it's a little bit of both. I think it's the numbers in clutch play and then a little bit of the narrative or the games or the moments like this. I, I think people are trying to weigh them both, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that's how I, I would. Guess. I think if I voted, had a vote. <laughs> yeah, but I think it's hustle player is the one where they just like look at yeah. deflections yeah. and stuff, right? Yeah. <laughs> totally. That's a good point. Uh, yes, <laughs> that's, a, that's a weird award. Um, this was the Bulls' tenth overtime game this season. You know, we've got like still uh, I don't know, fifteen Shocking. to twenty games to go. <laughs> They've already played ten. What's the record? Does anyone know? Schumann, where are you at, man? It's a great question. What's the record for an 82-game season for a team the number of times to play uh, an overtime game? I, I assume it's a little bit more, but can't be much more. That's a lot of games. That is a ton of games. <laughs> it's a good percentage of their games going to wow. overtime. I think it was the first one for the Pacers, too. Yes, they did say that. You can tell they were rattled. <laughs> they yeah. didn't know. What? Yeah. What are we on, doing man? out here? Yeah. Uh, any other thoughts on, on DeRozan uh, helping the Bulls get past Pacers? Well, the Pacers, they go deep on their team. We've talked about Aaron uh, Neesmith here. He wasn't there in in the overtime. They got so many guys. They their bench won forty seven to sixteen in this game. Mm-hmm. Fantastic to get them there. But it's one of those things now. Uh, here without Benedict Matherin, you think oh less points. But it, they do have so many defensive guys, and that's where they need to improve. So they showed that they could, and they try and go one through twelve. Pascal Siakam only took twelve shots in this game. Had a great night. But they try and distribute to everybody. So all five of their guys had double-digit shots. And that's the benefit of this team is that everybody can shoot, except for Halliburton last night, one of six from three. He just splashes a couple more threes. This game is long over. But it's it's one of those teams. Pacers knocked off OKC the night before. Wow, that's beautiful stuff. Yeah, that was a huge game. Uh, but then they lose. Uh, it happens to every freaking team. Yeah, back-to-back uh, situations are difficult for sure. And they played well, but the Bulls, especially with DeRozan late, just took over. And you are getting very close to the Bulls being back. They are two games below 500. Is that correct? <laughs> yes. Okay. Exactly right. They're getting close, man. I was counting my backs before they hatched over the weekend. I thought they were going to take down the Clippers and do it, but not quite. I actually thought the Pacers should have gone to Siakam more. Yeah. Uh, he was just bullying the Bulls. Yeah. They don't have anybody healthy right now who's like the right size and strength to guard a guy like Siakam. He's just playing bully ball all night, but only 12 shot attempts. That's the least in their starting lineup. The Bulls did a good job of getting the ball out of his hand. 
defense mm-hmm. at times, but they could have force fed him a little bit. Ended up with too many nine hard threes. And you're a little <laughs> more plugged in than I am when it comes to the Chicago scene. Do we have an update at all on Kobe White? They said it was a hip injury. Okay. It looked bad. He started grabbing his hip yeah. instantly. I don't understand how that's not a foul. Clean block by Siakam, absolutely. But then he does like a leg drop on top of Kobe <laughs> White's head after the play. And right, so you think, I mean, we, we get a, all up in arms about a guy stepping under a guy on a jump shot. And they'll call Can't that a foul. Near him. But a you think the flip here, if somebody falls on you, should also be uh, a foul. Do you have an opinion on that? I, I see what you're saying, but it's also, I mean, Siakam is also like air. It's amazing he didn't get hurt. I don't know how oh, he yeah. just, that guy's just rubber. Yeah. He just bounced back up, no problem. But It was like uh, the Anthony Edwards where he was chasing back. It was a, a real chase down block. And when you're doing that, you're going to hit the guy. And that happens. And I think the refs are just looking at it like, wow, that's so fun. A few <laughs> seconds left in a basketball game where a guy comes back and chases you down for a beautiful block so they don't call it. But you can easily call it. I, I think just there's But fewer, you're talking about fewer... the calling of Siakam landing on the guy. Yeah. Right? Because he didn't foul him no. in the air. Block no, was super even... clean. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. There's just a lot of contact. And that's going to happen when you, when you see a chase down block. Mm-hmm. But it's also just fun. Hopefully he's okay uh, moving forward. At yeah. least he walked off the floor like that's good. But uh, yeah, he was down there for a while. And you saw on the replays, like his leg is sort of, when he landed by himself, he sort of landed a little awkwardly. Mm-hmm. And then you have a guy that's, you know, 200 pounds come crashing down on top of you. Yeah. That's that's going to hurt. It's going to leave a mark. Uh, moving on. Donovan Mitchell returned to the Cavaliers. Uh, they were on fire from three. They hit 23s in the 116-95 win over the Pelicans, who had been playing really, really good here. Um, this is one of those games where it just boils down to three-point shooting, in all honesty, because you had Mitchell hitting four, Garland hit six, Sam Merrill hit five, George Niang, the minivan himself, hit four, 20 of 45 from deep, mm-hmm. while the Pelicans four of 22. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you have a lot to add to this game, but worth noting here that Mitchell's back and they caught fire. Right. Yeah, I don't think there is a ton, although... The free throw discrepancy was interesting. It went the other direction. Uh, Yeah, because the Cavs were out there shooting threes. This is the modern, modern day era, I think. We're seeing fewer free throws because the scores were just too high. So they've said, you know, let's have a little foul. See, there's more offense, but now there's fewer free throws. The Cavs didn't take a free throw until the fourth quarter. So they went a long time. And they only shot three in the fourth quarter. While Zion Williamson, I think, wanted more fouls. Although, you know, he went to the line a decent amount, but he was looking at the referees to give him a call. And and the entire building in New Orleans was asking it. Uh, hello, hello, he's got George Niang. He's running right <laughs> through that van. And, and listen, Niang was doing his thing. The Pelicans, yeah, not shooting, shooting threes was... That uh, was difficult. The Cavs took double the amount the Pelicans did. Um, and and I'm j- I just watched this Pelicans team. Maybe they play this, a similar thing. Like They are playing really well. They snapped their losing streak. The Jonas Valanciunas defense is going to be a question to me in the postseason because you can you can put them on an island and yeah. go at them, and that's what the Cavs did to generate the driving kicks and driving kicks, yeah. and that's why he didn't start the second half. Larry Nance started over him, so that is a question about this team. Although they've got Zion, he ain't playing the five. It's not it's not going to happen. Jonas Valanciunas, as good as he's been, as many Raptors as we've talked about, we talked about the, the basketball drones from the original Toronto. We talked about Pascal Siakam, <laughs> Demar's former teammate. He could have shot a heck of a lot more. Jonas Valanciunas has seen better days. This this NBA is just a little difficult for him defensively. Sure. And that's why he wasn't he wasn't playing that second half. Yeah. Or talk about start, I talk about say. today's game. New Orleans outscored Cleveland in the paint. They had the advantage 21 to 2 at the free throw line and it didn't matter because of the disparity in three point shooting. 20 to 4. That's 60 points to 12. <laughs> and that is why the Cavs won the <laughs> game. It. it sums it up right there. Yeah. Uh, do you have anything from this one? Yeah, I actually thought the Cavs reserves really won this game cuz it was pretty tight uh up until the third quarter when Karis LeVert, Sam Merrill, and Damian Jones, who was running wild Damian out there, Jones. checked in about six minutes left. They went on a 16-2 to run, finished plus 12 in the quarter in six minutes, turned the game into a blowout. They were just playing a lot faster, I thought, than the Pelicans were, even though it wasn't all fast breaks. They were just flying through their actions. Pelicans had to be in rotation the entire time. Karis LeVert, only two points last night, but nine assists. They were trying to stop him, and he was getting off the ball quickly. Uh, Darius Garland, man, he's turned it around this season. He had a really slow start earlier in the year, shooting the ball, but since getting healthy, since 
the all-star break 47 percent from three and then you mentioned niang he's lights out right now as well <laughs> the van the van man <laughs> guy is a weird yeah. guy to watch play he is, <laughs> he is a weird guy he was sidestep he was sidestepping yeah. into his yeah. threes it wasn't just catch and shoot he's Moved on. The, the, that was a parallel park by that van to sidestep uh, beyond the three-point line. <laughs> it's not How easy to nice? do. Yeah. No, it wasn't. Uh, NBA Finals rematch uh, last night on ESPN. Nuggets beat the Heat 100-88. to And Denver has taken sole possession of first place in the Western Conference standings. They're an NBA best 10-1 and since the All-Star break. And I saw that the Nuggets are 32-9. and this year when their go-to starting five of Jokic, Murray, Michael Porter Jr., Aaron Gordon, and Contavious Caldwell-Pope are all together in the lineup. Pretty good record, and, uh, you know, they are not scared of the Miami Heat at all. We talk sometimes about, like, maybe the Bucks are scared of the Heat. Maybe the Celtics are, are rightfully scared of the Heat come playoff time. Denver Nuggets are not. I think no, that's not. safe to say. They sort of just own them. 12-1 and one in their yeah. last 13 against the Miami yeah. Heat. Yeah. yeah. Um, but what do you think of Denver getting the 12-point win? This was a crunch time game. <laughs> this was a five-point game. Yeah, that's a good point. With four minutes and 35 seconds left after Terry Rozier made a jump shot. Nikola Jokic took one shot in the final five minutes, zero assists, and he completely won him the game with screening. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, screen talk. <laughs> first uh, first two were on Terry Rozier. He was guarding Reggie Jackson, yeah, yeah. and Jokic just takes him completely out of the play. Reggie walks into two easy 15-footers. Timeouts happen. Subs happen. Now it's Jimmy Butler who's guarding Reggie Jackson. He dances around the Jokic pick, but Reggie Jackson's in the little flow. Hits the step back three. Turned a five-point game into a ten-point game. The guy barely touched the ball in the fourth quarter, or at least down the stretch here, and just was blasting. The <laughs> tiny little heat out there, getting wide-open looks for Reggie Jackson. Not even for Jamal Murray. No. Jamal was happy to let him cook. Then they finally checked Murray in as well, and somehow this turned into a 12-point game when it was five points <laughs> with four minutes yeah. left. Yeah. That's how good the Nuggets are at flipping the switch. Totally. Reggie Jackson three threes on three consecutive possessions. That's friggin' impressive, but you're totally right. This was just a late scoring game for them. They held Miami to four points in the last four and a half minutes. So they won it in the fourth quarter. That's what they do. This That's kind of what championship teams do. Yeah. They look at the fourth quarter and they say, all right, we'll do this thing. Let's turn it up. And Michael Malone, head coach, said this after the game. Sometimes we always talk about something, excuse me, we always talk about is that your fourth quarter has to be your best quarter. It's closing time. As my closing Malone's time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Get the guitar. Nick Nurse is like, hold on. <laughs> I don't know. He's the only guy that plays guitar in the NBA. I would sing it. Those are the only lyrics I know. <laughs> you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. That's it. That's it. I was going to go, it's closing. It's closing time. It's not a song. What? That's, it's business time. <laughs> business that's business time. time. Yeah, yeah. But that's where I go. Oh, Wednesday yeah. is the night. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's true. If you're getting back, Jack Armstrong always sings that song. Yeah, that's you, right. You just sang. But we always talk about Jokic. We talk about Murray. And then Gordon. Those are the first three nuggets we talk about. And then we KCP might be the fourth. Nah, maybe it might be Michael Porter Jr. But that guy contributes. They have so many guys who contribute. He had five threes last night. He's on fire since yeah. the All-Star break. Shout out to uh, ESPN's Cassidy Hubberth for bringing this up on the broadcast. Uh, he's averaging over 20 points per game since they came back from the break. Michael Porter Jr. is shooting 55% from the field, 43% from deep, and 93% at the line. He doesn't get there a ton, but I think he's 16 of 18 at the line since they've come back. That's huge. Wow. They got another 20-point-per-game score. We've yeah. seen him have these moments and these stretches for sure, but that's... Those are unreal, efficient numbers there from all three facets. Uh, so he's got it going. He's a big reason why they are barely lost here since they came back. And they had their eyes on that number one seed when the texts started flying around. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Sending yeah. those texts. Don't get me anything for my birthday. All I want is the one seed. <laughs> and then he blasts his teammates saying, they didn't give me anything they didn't for give my anything. birthday. Well, they got it. It was a late birthday gift. They're number <laughs> one seed now. Yeah, we'll Just get you the one while. seed. We'll get you the one seed. I also thought uh, the Aaron Gordon small ball five. We've seen it a lot of times, but, you know, the Nuggets try to stay away from it during the regular season. Zeke Naji got some run in the first half to save Aaron Gordon's legs, and then the reserves plus Aaron Gordon at small ball five. Like, they were completely cooking, uh, I thought, in this one. Yeah, that was the question coming into the season. Do they have enough guys? And Peyton Watson looks great. He's a great defender, had a monster uh, dunk in this game. To give them the first seed alone for yep. the first time in four months. Yeah. They haven't been up there since freaking middle of November, and here they are. Don't go to the White House. That gets you the first seat, I guess. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. 
Uh, moving on, Sabonis, another triple double for this guy as the Kings beat the Lakers 120 to 107. They swept the Lakers for only their second time in franchise history. So took all four games versus LA in pretty dominant fashion here. Your thoughts, TK? DeMontis Sabonis is 10 and 0 against Anthony Davis' career. Yeah. I saw this too. I, I was surprised. I was, I was surprised. Whoa. I mean, like, I'm guessing some of those Pacers and Pelicans teams were evenly matched. The yeah. Lakers have won a title, you know, with yes. Anthony Davis. You would assume that yeah. they are uh, ahead of the Kings, but Sabonis, he's not afraid of Anthony Davis. When he plays, and- when he plays just because uh, I looked it up, four of those games were when Sabonis was on the Thunder. That's a long Whoa. time That's a long time ago. Oh, well, he was only on the floor with Anthony Davis when he was a Pacer just once. And then five were with the Kings. There you go. So Weird so, stuff. But, but he has been rolling. He has been rolling, obviously, you know, the last five games with the Kings. And this year, a sweep. 17 points, 19 boards, and 10 assists. And the physicality he brings to Davis, that's a place where you can maybe exploit Anthony Davis sometimes if you're able to just get your shoulder into him and push yeah. him around. There was that play, I guess it was probably in the third quarter, uh, where he just sizes up AD, spins, spins, somehow knocks him down with a spin move and finishes over top of him as well. It was impressive stuff. And then it's kind of weird because I feel like Davis can't handle Sabonis' physicality the whole time. Mm -hmm. And on the perimeter, the Lakers can't stick with the Kings' speed. So it's kind of like a a Fox and Ox situation out there for him. And that's why the Kings seem to have the Lakers' number right now. Big shooting nights, too, from Keegan Murray, who hit five threes, and then Harrison Barnes who hit seven. So those guys contributing 12 three-pointers for Sacramento. And, you know, the Lakers, like, got back in this game, and it felt like every time they did, it was one of those two guys, especially Harrison Barnes, who had, like, a timely three to sort of give them a little bit of breathing room. And uh, they went on to win pretty handily. The Kings, man. (laughs) Fascinating team. They have an incredible record. I know the Lakers are not near the top of the Western Conference, but they have a good record against the good teams in the West. They're going to be playing, in theory, a good team in a play-in situation or maybe even in the playoffs if they can stay in that top six. Um, I'm just fascinated to see if they can get their first playoff series win in a very, very, very long time. Yeah, the Kings get ready for the good teams. That is totally true. And I think the Lakers are good enough in that category for them to look at and say, all right, we're going to play. Yeah. We're going to do this. It's similar to what we saw with the Pelicans last night. You get good performances from time to time. And I thought... Keon Ellis starting for Kevin Herter was good for them. He's been uh, a guy, 24-year-old, undrafted, who plays hard defensively, might take Davion Mitchell's minutes at times, but he was great, hitting multiple threes. They were yeah. just spacing the floor against them. That's kind of where this game was won, uh, partly, uh, because they were quick, as Trey said. Five more threes than the Lakers. That hurt. And D'Angelo Russell, you know, he said he was a killer a couple weeks ago. I'm a killer. That's what I do. He was killed in this one. Yeah, bad deal. <laughs> yes, game. Was. Six yeah. points, two and nine shooting, only one three, uh, two turnovers to six assists. Yeah, not a good D-Lo game. He was due <laughs> for a real bad <laughs> stinker, <laughs> unfortunately for him. Uh, one other game I really want to uh, break down here with you guys. Lucas scored 21, but his triple-double streak ended at seven as the Mavs got past the Warriors 109 to 99. So a few things. First off, the Warriors need Steph Curry desperately to come back. They've dropped five of their last six this season without him. Kerr said before the game Curry should join the team in Los Angeles, and the coach was hopeful that Curry might play in Saturday's game against the Lakers. That's a nationally televised game. That's a big game when you're looking at the standings there uh, in the playing spots right now. So they need him. I mean, that's that's a no-brainer. Uh, Chris Paul? Did you guys see Chris Paul give the referee a tech after he got a tech? <laughs> That was a first for me. It was amazing. Chris Paul arguing about the no call, sort of at the end of a shot clock there. He's like, what the heck? I got hit. He gets teed up for arguing. And so while PJ Washington is like going like this, like crazy with the tech, Chris Paul just very calmly gives a tech back to the referee. <laughs> That was it. <laughs> what a guy, man. I mean, I guess you can get away with that when you've played as long as Chris Paul and you've been the president of the Players Union and stuff like that. <laughs> Just a weird... It looked funny because we had three people basically giving the tech signal all within like a, a five-second span. I guess it wasn't Scott Foster. It wasn't Scott that Foster. That would have been great. <laughs> no, I forget, I forget the name of this official. He would have teed him up it for wasn't, sure. It wasn't Scott. He would have been kicked out. You're right. Yeah. But then Chris Paul would have kicked him out. 
Oh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> we need a best Chris Paul referee moments pack put together because there was that time. Like, yep. Who did he notice that had their jersey untucked? Oh, right, <laughs> Got a right. technical yeah. foul for knowing the jersey rules. Uh, that's got to make the list. This would make the list. Funny stuff. There's got to be numerous oh, examples man, yeah. of him yeah, officiating <laughs> a game. Uh, I said Lucas triple-double. His run ended at seven games. He only played 30 minutes due to a tender left hamstring. That's something to watch. Jason Kidd said he wasn't sure if Luca would make the trip to OKC. They play tonight. That's a, a back-to-back situation for Dallas. That is also a nationally televised game. That one's on TNT. So my gut would say Luca sits this one out, but keep your eye on that. Obviously, they need him moving forward. But, you know, he sort of came back in for a second. And he's like, nope, nope. Didn't matter nope. in the end because they got the win, but that always sucks. And then finally, Daniel Gafford made all five baskets last night to push his streak to 33 field goals made in a row. Those dreamy eyes staring down (laughs) Wilt Chamberlain for the best run of consecutive made baskets in NBA history. Gafford just two away from tying that all-time mark. It's wild when you do the little deep dive into shot selection for Daniel Gafford. 17 of Gafford's 33 straight buckets have been dunks including all five last night uh, in the win. 31 of them have come with at least one foot inside the restricted area. So we're talking basically all dunks and layups. Uh, Of those, maybe uh, three or four have been contested with someone even near him. Uh, He is not a jump shooter. In fact, when you look at the numbers, 366 of his 376 attempts have come from inside the paint this season. And most of those within, like, the four-foot little restricted area. He's only taken 69 shots this entire season that weren't a layup or dunk. Mm. (laughs) I mean, this is all this guy does. Hey, do what you're good at, right? Play to your strength. So, CBS Sports informed me that Gafford is on track to own the NBA's all-time mark for career field goal percentage. Among all players to attempt at least 2,000 shots, DeAndre Jordan at 67.4% has the best you know, rate from the field in NBA history. Again, 2,000 attempts. Gafford is at just over 1,500 attempts. So he's got a little bit to go until we hit that 2,000 shot mark, but he's currently posting a 70.6 career field goal percentage. So this might be something in play here, especially if he's playing with Luka yeah. for the next couple of years, that he might become the all-time leader in field goal percentage for career. And then, of course, he's trying to chase Wilt here. And uh, at this point, he's just got to do it. Just He won't take a shot. Just don't take a shot unless it's a dunk. <laughs> totally. <laughs> he really is going to have to get blocked, I think, for this to snap here in, in like maybe the next game or the, the one after that. You said they got the Thunder next. Yes, Ooh. I do Chad tonight. Holmgren is a good shot blocker. No mm. Luca, this too. Is a big test. Maybe, maybe no Luca. Yeah, <laughs> this is a huge test for Daniel. Big Gafford. test. <laughs> big test tonight. Keep your eyes on TNT. They better have a Gafford counter on the, the screen. Gafford watch. <laughs> yeah, with it, again with his beautiful eyes. Maybe there on the screen as a bug, as he ticks up. Hopefully catches Wilt. It'd be very funny if Daniel Gafford has this record. I, I really, I'm hoping for it. <laughs> I think, I think it'll happen. So I think I. he's going to be uh, very judicious about his shot selection for the next three shots that he takes <laughs> i would also love to see i've seen a compilation of his 33 straight makes and you're exactly right yeah he hit like two tough shots yeah where there's like hands in his face yeah. i would like to see a compilation of the times he's dribbled since he came to the dallas mavericks has it happened yet uh does he have a dribble as a matter <laughs> yeah, i sure. don't know i'm not sure no dribble dan that's so, what they call him okay so you think should he play it like this tonight thunder obviously try and get those three let's say dunks or layups to set the record, to beat Wilt, and then on that next shot, he should just pull up from half. <laughs> or like take a three. Just get silly with it. You got the record. Why not? Or will he really try and really try and pad that record? Get it up into the forties, maybe the fifties, something like that. <laughs> can't wait to see how he tackles this. Yeah. I can't believe looking at the stats. He is the all time leader right now. Right now. At seventy one percent. I just just didn't didn't compute to me. I just I didn't know. think of it. And next, Jakob Pertl. That's sixty five point six percent. That's a pretty big gap. Yeah, yeah considering percentage wise. Yeah, considering there's lots of guys who don't shoot. Rudy Gobert is fourth. 
So that's uh, <laughs> there's lots of guys who just keep it in the restricted area. I can't believe that you know the fact. That fact is interesting that he's had one foot in the restricted yeah, area look, for a lot of these shots. The stats are out there. Yeah. CBS Sports helping me out this morning with that. Uh, the other games, we had Michich. The Rooks score in a career best 25. Hornets beat the Grizzlies 110 98. Pella Bancaro 21. Led the Magic over the Nets 114 106. Anthony Simons and DeAndre Ayton, who's on a heater right now. Uh, he had 33. Portland beat the Hawks 106 102, despite DeJounte Murray with a big game. And then Jalen Duran, career high 23 rebounds. That's a lot of roast beef. As the Pistons beat the Raps 113 104 for their third win in four and a big win in the Nut Dust Bowl standings, <laughs> task taking the lead back from me. And my Wizards. Uh, any thoughts on any of those games? Well, Jalen Duran, 24 and 23 for a 20 year old, triple 20s. That's uh, impressive stuff uh, for them. One, two in a row for the third time this season. <laughs> but three and four, that's the first time they've done that all season long. Yeah. So they're winning basketball games. DeAndre Ayton. He's a March man. This is when he turns it on. <laughs> totally. He's a March man. Yeah, I think so. It doesn't matter. Let me get those stats. Let me he's get a it. March Let man. me yeah, kill it. Yeah, he's like, I think this is like three games in a row that he's put up some monster numbers. He's going to be winning somebody a, a fantasy championship here mm. as you get into the to the home stretch and maybe even, I don't know, when the postseason starts for some of these leagues. Doesn't kill you on free throws? No, he's right. He shoots a great percentage. He takes maybe one a game. <laughs> he's good when he's playing like this, but uh, you think it's just uh, you're not going to be uh, banking on this at the start of next year? No. <laughs> that's why Phoenix uh, said we're ready to go. Unfortunately, <laughs> that's been the story of DeAndre Ayton's career. Mm-hmm. Hasn't jived with many people. Um, and jived with some, but I guess he didn't get it along with Monty Williams all that much. Anyways, we are here in this year six of DeAndre Ayton's <laughs> career. I mean, he's a talented guy. He signed that monster deal, but uh, can't be a number one guy until March. Then you can just give him the ball. Just go for it, man. Yeah, since coming back from uh, a little injury there, he's had games of 30 and 19, 22 and 15, and then last night, 33 and 19. He's killing it. He's hooping. This was against the Raptors, the Celtics, and the Hawks. And two of those in wins for Portland too so it's actually helping him up there yeah Chris Paul Chris Paul's just on a podcast I want him on another podcast where he's asked about his relationship with DeAndre Ayton mm. did you like him did you hate him tell me why you hated him tell me the him. truth yeah <laughs> uh, do you have any thoughts on any of those games well call him Bradley Cooper cause Vasa Micic is the maestro oh, oh my God. <laughs> 25 points 8 assists 9 for 10 from the field 5 for 6 from 3 had the Serbian connection working with Poku I don't know why the Thunder could never unlock that duo, but they assisted each other at least three times yeah. in this game, and Mijic was just cooking. It was like pick and roll every single time with him, and he was just finding um, the pocket pass every time to guys you've never heard of. Like It was Mijic versus Trey Jemison out there. Oh, yeah. Stay tuned for some shorts coming out there. because uh, there's some random names going on <laughs> in a Hornets-Grizzlies game right now. Oh, my God, is there ever. And Mijic, I think Ziller brought this up in his newsletter. Hopefully he's playing for Serbia. Come, come the summer here with some some Jokic and some Pokus and uh, he can play. I mean, he, he, he really can. Um, so great game from him. Uh, let's take a break. Hold on, was the Maestro good? No, no, didn't, no, didn't watch no, it. no. It's not. Didn't watch it. It's not. No. It's a Netflix. Yeah, it's hit. Not, I don't. I would not recommend it. I did not uh, like it. <laughs> it felt a little too much like uh, Bradley Cooper was really going for his uh, for his Oscar. He, he did say. it all. I mean, he directed it. I think he produced it. He's he obviously like the a star maestro, in it. Huh? He was a maestro in it. <laughs> Martin Scorsese produced it, though? Oh, no, he's on. He's on the list, know, Maybe, here. but it's his. It's his movie, is my point. Mm. Cooper's movie, and it's, it's, it's not that great. It's not. Is Don't it all black and white? Uh, or is it just screenshots remember. I've seen? No, yeah, it's, there's some black and white. Yeah, I don't think the whole okay. thing was. No. Nice. I think there's a little color in it. <laughs> uh, okay, quick break. When we come back, NBA Awards talk. Don't go anywhere. Selling a little? Yeah. Cha-ching. Or a lot? (laughs) Shopify helps you do your thing however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage? Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're selling savory sausages or offering ostentatious oddities, Shopify helps you sell everywhere. From their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their 
their in-person POS system wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify has got you covered. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout. 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms. And you can sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. No matter how big you want to grow, Shopify gives you everything you need to take control and take your business to the next level. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the United States, and Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way, because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash no dunks, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com. Dot com slash no dunks now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in shopify.com slash no dunks well it's our lucky day because john schumann is in the chat he is in the stream team and he's dropping nuggets left and right because we got all these questions about guys and how little they dribble and overtime games for a season uh, give me some of the schumann stats here stats in the chat brought to you by john schumann <laughs> most overtime wins the 2000-2001 Sacramento Kings won nine overtime games. I just looked. They played 12 overtime games. Okay. Most overtime losses, the 2000-2001 Clippers. I wonder if they played each other in overtime. Huh. I'll check into that. And also the 1952-53 <laughs> Bullets, they both lost 10 overtime games in those seasons. Wow. So that's a crazy one. Let's uh, scroll down here. This one was just tossed in. Not even requested. <laughs> the Heat went 0-8 against the top four seeds in the Western Conference. The only other winless teams against that group are the Blazers and Wizards. Hmm. Oh, can't be encouraging if you're betting on the Heat to win the no. NBA championship no. this season. That was just a free one. Thank nice you one. for Thank John you. Schumann. That, that's just one he's like, I don't, I'm I not even going to put this in the power rankings. Yeah. I got too much. <laughs> I'll just chuck it in the stream team chat. All right, thanks, Shu. Uh, he also mentions that the Kings and Wolves haven't won a playoff series since 2004, and the Hornets also haven't won a series since 2004, which was the year the Bobcats were born. Holy, holy moly. That one's just another free one for you. And then we're talking dribbles, no dribble Dan. Daniel Gafford has averaged 0 0.28 dribbles per touch since joining the Dallas Mavericks. Derek Lively has actually averaged fewer 0 0.20 dribbles per touch per touch wow that's incredible that's a very little dribbling yeah maybe like a dribble handoff catch the ball at yeah, the top of the key little. dribble it then hand it to Kyrie or Luca to do something roll to the cup and he'll throw you an alley-oop <laughs> sure what great stats incredible stats shoe we'll find you another podcast that has NBA's own John Schumann live dropping nuggets like that <laughs> You can't. You can't. Though People I will are going say, wild right now. They're I, saying, nug me up, John. <laughs> <laughs> I will say I watched uh, just randomly uh, flipping through the guide last night. Um, there was early games on, and then I was waiting for some Survivor. And I saw on ESPN News, the Zach Lowe podcast. It's on TV. Hey. Yeah, yeah. it was uh, him and Pelton. You know, it's just their podcast, but just, uh, you know, put into television form. Every media company is doing that. I know. I know. So you guys record a podcast? The podcast. Put it on our television. They're doing yeah, so. it. Yeah. Schumann recorded a pod with Sarah Kustak, I do believe, recently, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, they totally usually wrong. Yeah, they usually do. Yeah. Um, not on TV, though. No. Sorry, Schum. You can't put Schumann on TV? Oh, my God. <laughs> Kidding, Schu. Uh, oh, that Derek Lively mark, by the way, lowest dribbles per touch in the league. Wow. Guess who that one came from? <laughs> Alan's from Schumann. Alan is from Schumann. Point two. So Pierre we... Publico says, Shoe ought to know. <laughs> Shoe Jack says, Shoe, Shoe, Shoe putting on a master class. Shoe ought to know. Now that sounds like a television segment right yeah. there. Shoe ought to know. Oh, yeah, man. Uh, we got a C block with your name on it, John. Oh, this is great. Uh, let's get into some NBA awards, the odds, the predictions. Uh, we have fewer than 20 games to play which is, you know, maybe a little shocking to some. But here's where all of the current NBA awards races stand. I feel, in going through this, that, like, maybe four, if not five of these are already wrapped up. But I'm interested to hear your guys' takes and everybody joining us live on YouTube or listening to the podcast later. So we'll move through these with some pace because we've talked about them a lot. But the MVP right now, Jokic is still the favorite, uh, minus 275. Then we have SGA plus 400 and Luca coming up with plus 800 
Trey, I know where you stand on this. You believe Jokic is, what, 99% going to win his third MVP here in four years? Is that too high? Does SGA, like, could the Thunder get the number one seed, and would that be enough to sway some people? What do you think? Well, I don't think Jokic will be unanimous by okay. any means, but he was the leader in the MB, in the MVP straw poll that Tim Bontemps does over at ESPN. He was the leader most recently, but though I think he said at the time that if you're the leader in that one, you don't win, usually. <laughs> true, true. But then we saw Jokic have a massive game against the Celtics in a big spot. So that, to me, is when he won it. It's like a Heisman Trophy moment that people always talk about. But Shea definitely has a case, especially if the Thunder do end with the one seed. Yeah. Ironically enough, like he will be ahead of Jokic in a lot of advanced stats, which is usually where Jokic has made his hay uh, <laughs> in some of these MVP votes. Uh, but I think that Jokic is kind of widely recognized as the best player in the league right now. And the Nuggets have turned it on in the back half of the season here. Jokic putting up great numbers as well. And the Nuggets are winning a bunch of games and his defense has been pretty solid as well. So I think it's going to be Jokic. Three and four years. It sure feels like that's going to happen here in March, which is odd because earlier on, before Jokic went on this run, we were all, we and everybody out there was giving it to Shea, was giving it to, uh, you know, maybe me, 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 a little, little Luca. Giannis was in there, but now it's it's become locked. So it is, it all doesn't really matter in January is what I'm saying, although it's fun to talk about. I remember talking to the great Dikembe Mutombo on our show it was the starters. He was on in early January. We asked him, is LeBron going to win the uh, the MVP? It was 2018. He didn't want to answer that. He said, it's too early, man. Basically <laughs> is what he said. It's too huh? early. He's right. He's right. It, it was a little too early. But now it's it feels like even with a month left, which kind of goes with, with what I'm arguing here, that it's too early, it doesn't feel like it's too early for Nikola Jokic. It feels like he's got it at this point. Do you think, I don't know, the Thunder just go on a crazy run here to end and – win the West by a handful of games, would that be enough to persuade people to vote for him? I mean, he'd be deserving, would he not? If they had the number one seed with yeah. his stats. Let's, you know, throw in another SGA uh, game winner or two. Like, I'm with you. It feels like it's like, maybe not 99% locked up, but it feels like it's like 90% going to go to Jokic. But mm-hmm. I think there's a small, small chance that SGA could get it. You're Unlikely right. as it is. You're right. Yeah. And his defense is freaking great. Yeah. And I think yeah. people... People don't include that in his conversation. Um, Jokic is good, too. There's no doubt. But Shea is awesome uh, on both ends. Rookie of the year. Uh, the odds favor Wembenyama. I couldn't believe by how much, though. I can't believe that. I I thought it was a typo. I was like, where am I? This is <laughs> Looks wrong. like a joke. <laughs> okay, Wembenyama for rookie of the year. Who? I mean, I've been saying for a very long time he is going to win this and is deserving of it. But minus 10,000. <laughs> Then Chet Holmgren, who's having an incredible rookie of the year, would win it most other years. He's plus 2,500. And then Brandon Miller, they has got to put a third name on the list. He's plus 50,000. Don't <laughs> vote on him. 50,000? Yeah. That was so, just some wild odds. So, yeah, okay. So, you guys, it sounds like you were just as shocked that, yeah, as much as we think Weminyama is going to get this, <laughs> it's, a, it's a little glaring, the difference in odds, is it not? Yeah, you literally have to put down ten thousand dollars to win a hundred. Don't do that. If you want to bet on Victor Wembanyama, you literally have to put on put down ten thousand dollars to win just one hundred dollars. I, I would never do that. I'd be more inclined to put down a hundred dollars to win fifty thousand for Brandon Miller. But there ain't I no way. Do that either. Yeah. No, there ain't no way you're gonna win. Yeah. Uh, you know, you could, you'd probably be, I guess, smarter if you're gambling to put it on Chet Holmgren. I mean, these are more. This is more gambling line than actual guys who are going to win for sure. You know, it has l- less to do with the voting and more ha- has more to do with the dollar dollar bills and who where people are putting money. Yeah. But but it definitely feels like Wembenyama yeah, is going to win this thing. But like the, uh, odds- the home grin bet, not bad, not a bad one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The odds exploded. It felt like in, in favor of Wembenyama even more when they had that last matchup, and they both put up good numbers. But Wemby sort of got the best of them, had that crazy block on him. You know. Um, that helped his case. He's going to win. I'm I'm curious to see does Chet get or how many first place votes he gets. There, I think he will. I think I people, think so. I think people will be like you know look at the numbers are are similar and he's on a better team than Weminyama and maybe they are the number one seed or whatever top three whatever. So he might get a few, but Weminyama Trey is your <laughs> is your pick I assume to win this overall. Yeah, I mean, why, might as well bet on him. You're going to win. <laughs> You're going to win pennies. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe dimes, depending on how much you <laughs> uh, ante up, but uh, minus 10,000. 
I don't know. Plus fifty thousand looks hilarious. Too. <laughs> my guy Brad Miller. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. B Miller. There. <laughs> B Miller. All right, let's move on to defense. Uh, Rudy Gobert is the odds-on favorite still. Minus 900 to win another Defensive Player of the Year. Wembenyama second, plus 700. And then Jared Allen uh, in third at plus 3,000. Rudy, you know, leads the league in defensive win shares and defensive rating, and he holds down the middle for the best defensive team in the league. He leads the league in opponent field goal percentage inside six feet. You know, it's tough to score on this guy. He ranks second in the league in uh, rebounds, just as Sabonis. He averages almost 13 per game. So I think this is going to be the the pick for sure here, and the odds makers agree with that. Your takeaway? Yeah, I think it's smart that they put Wemby in here at plus 700. More likely to get action on that than a minus 10,000 because I don't think Wembenyama is going to win it, but he's leading the league in shot blocking, and he might actually be the best defensive player in the league, but his team's defense is pretty poor, yeah. so there's no chance he really has of winning it, though I do think he will get some votes, and I think Gobert is the right choice because of the way that the Timberwolves have had the top defense in the league basically the entire season because of Rudy Gobert, and that's one of the main reasons they're so high in the Western yeah. Conference. I think he is a deserving choice. Yeah, it just took us like one year later. We thought this was going to be the case last year with Rudy Gobert when he went to Minnesota, mm. and then it wasn't, and yep. they weren't that you know elite defensively, but they obviously are this year, and you think they'll win. They got the narrative, that's for sure, and that helps when voting for the defensive player, although defensive win shares and all that matters. It is the most difficult award to assess by stats. Mm-hmm. IMO. But Gobert's awesome. That is totally clear, and he says that, or he thinks that there's some fixing within the gambling, so I wonder if he uh, bets on himself here. Oh, oh, well, he says, better he, not. Yeah, why not? You're going to win. Why not? I don't think it's legal. <laughs> it's probably not legal, but he knows somebody. <laughs> like, when he complains that a referee doesn't do it, or the referee, or, ref, or referees could be putting money in, he knows that somebody could be giving a referee money. He could bet it through, through his friend. Intermediaries. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If he, middleman. if he or when he, I guess, Rudy Gobert is, wins his fourth Defensive Player of the Year, that joins rare company. Dikembe and Ben Wallace, the only other two guys to have four of uh, those trophies. Dwight has three, uh, which Rudy obviously has right now. He won in 18, 19, 21, and then Rudy could possibly win here in 23, 24 season. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. And like... Who's to say? I mean, Wemon Yama, the good thing about him being second, it's like with Defensive Player of the Year, it is always like it's like a year or two late. So you got to get on these lists, and that really helps his chances maybe next year, Wemon Yama, yeah. to win it if the Spurs are better and their team defense is better. And obviously his stats are similar. But, man, Rudy, like he might have. Uh, I don't know. I guess he could have another. Why wouldn't he have another possibly one or two in him? To mm-hmm. break the tie if he goes on to win yeah. this fourth one with Dikembe and Ben Wallace. You're yeah. right, though. It'd have to happen quickly. Because yes. Wembenyama will start winning them pretty soon. Like, if the Spurs somehow finish top 15 in defense and Wemby is playing the way he did yeah. this season, he would probably win it. Yeah, Rudy has changed since last year It just in terms of guarding space. Look at the teams that go up against the Timberwolves and the way they shoot threes and the, watching that guy come out. I mean, he's, he's just way more nimble. But Wemby's coming for him, that's for sure. Sixth man of the year, Malik Monk is the favorite. Minus 350, at least this one's a little closer though. Norman Powell, plus 450, and Nas Reed. Drop your Nas Reed in the chat, plus 1100. But it feels like Malik Monk's last couple of weeks maybe reinforced his chances to win his first. Sixth man of the year, he's obviously been on that list before. But he is the leader among backups in clutch scoring average. Interesting. So I think, Monk, I have been saying this one for a long time, especially around January. I thought the odds were really good then. I think they were like plus 800 for him. And I think he's sort of taken this over as some of these other names have slid a little bit or haven't maybe. You know, Tim Hardaway Jr. was in discussion for a while. Bobby Portis' name. Karis LeVert, you've brought up. Trey. Um, Jordan Clarkson has monster games sometimes off the bench. But I think, Monk, I think he's deserving too. I, You know, I've said before in the clutch sort of stats back it up his points just for whatever reason in games feel a little bit more significant at times to me but thoughts on six man i'm definitely good with monk i'm definitely kind of good with norman powell to be honest Uh, he's he's awesome uh he was up there in voting last year he was fourth and monk was fifth surprisingly i I totally skipped my mind uh but both those guys extremely deserving and both have played in a ton of games here 63 and 64 respectively does that factor into voting I guess not, but it showed a little bit uh, if you play that many games. And all on the bench, primarily. 
basically every single game that Malik Monk has played has come off the bench. It isn't one of those weird situations where you start a bunch of games. Well, like Nas Reed right now is getting more more opportunity with the Carl Anthony Towns injury. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, you know, it can goose numbers and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, Monk is a he is a certified six-man. So is Powell. I think he only started one game. Yeah. Um, Nas yeah. only has one start as well. Uh, does he? Okay, uh, yeah. But That's why did. I caught myself. I was going to say he's yeah. getting more starts, but I, they're actually not starting him. And he had a great game yeah. uh, when he started. 25 points, but then he went back to the bench. Only scored six in a big win over the Clippers. I think Nas Reed could make a little run here at the end of the season just because, like you're saying, Towns is out. So it wouldn't be surprising to see Reed in the closing lineup with the Timberwolves, and he's got a fun game to watch as well. He plays like a guard, even though he's their four slash five. Yeah, it feels like one of the first awards we've talked about that it's still like could be decided. I think Monk will win, but yeah, you're right, Powell, Reed, maybe one of those other guys. Uh, those first three awards we talked about. I mean, it feels like it's gonna be Jokic, Wemby, and Gobert winning their respective awards. This next one though might still be open. Uh, most improved. Tyrese Maxey is still the favorite, last I checked, minus 145. Kobe White, though, right behind him, plus 110. And then J-Dub, Jalen Williams on the Thunder, um, plus 3,000. So it's a two-man race, TK. Uh, for a long time, you've been thinking Kobe White will, you know, maybe should be the front runner, maybe will win this. There's a fair debate here. Obviously, both guys have had great improved seasons. Um but maybe make the case for Kobe. Well, Maxie. Kobe White is the most improved. I think that that's clear, but Tyrese Maxey is most similar to recent most improved yeah. winners, going from a good player to an all-star, largely because he played the first 34 games of the season with Joel Embiid, and he was the perfect yeah. guy right next to him. But Maxey's field goal percentage is down. Three-point percentage is down. I mean, he's scoring a little bit more because he's taking more shots, but Kobe White's percentages, all of them are up. He's scoring 10 points more per game this season, and he looks like a real player now rather than maybe a bench guard. So, uh, to me, he is the most improved guy. Uh, Maxie, a little bit of an Embiid merchant, but I love Maxie as well, so I don't really want to diss him too hard here. But I think Kobe White would have won this award in 2014. You, oh, back in the day. Yeah, back yeah. when the most improved player won rather than the best player who improved as well. True. Maxi has seen his odds get considerably worse over the last couple of weeks. Um, you know, he was, again, he's down to minus 145. It was like minus 550, so he was really the favorite. Uh, he missed four or seven games in March because of the concussion. Sixers have stumbled in the standings. His his numbers are great. 26, 6, and 4. He never turns the ball over for a lead guard. But Kobe White is up to like basically averaging 25 and 4, hitting 39% of his his three pointers. Those are all career bests. And Trey, like you said, it's like he's proven, he's shown, he's like, oh, this guy is a this guy is an NBA starter. When we were wondering, this guy, how long is this guy gonna be around in the league? Like, okay, he's like he's okay, but he's put it together, Tass. And this is gonna be a close vote, I think, this this year, Maxi and White. Yeah. Especially because it is two different types of way of looking at a most improved player. Yeah. With Maxi going to the All Star game for the first time, and Kobe White being younger um, at year number five, though I think year five is acceptable. I mean, you just made Trey made me go back into those years where they were giving it to guys who looked a little more most improved. Aaron Brooks, remember him? He won this thing in nice his one. in his third year when he scored nineteen and a half points, but he came back to earth. Mm-hmm. Um, not a nice earth, I guess, for him. Uh, the rest of his <laughs> career, I mean, he really he scored 19 and a half points that year. There wasn't another year where he scored 12 or more in his you know fairly long career, 11 year career. So, um, Kobe White, I do think, is different than Aaron Brooks. He's going to be good uh, for a long time in this league. So it, it is different. It's two different types of, of thinking. And Jonathan Kuminga also fits this different type of thinking. He is younger, uh, earlier in his career. Uh, but it has gotten a lot better. And so he'll, he's going to get some votes. He'll get well. on some ballots for sure. Yeah. Uh, next one, coach of the year. Here are your uh, front runners, according to the odds makers. Uh, OKC's Dagnalt. All right. He is your favorite. Minus 300. You got the Celtics, Joe Missoula at plus 450. And then the Timberwolves, Finch at plus 500. Bloody good coach, that Finch. Um, okay. Oh, and, and maybe there's another coach that you want in the mix here, but. This one, this one is, uh, I don't think, wrapped up by any means, but maybe I'm wrong. You think Dagnalt's going to win for OKC? Probably. 
Okay. Uh, I would say probably just because Thunder expectations were pretty high this season, but I think they've still exceeded those expectations. They're obviously younger and they're dealing with a new piece in Chet Holmgren coming in as a starter, as a five, buying into it and looking awesome. Whereas the Celtics... Also, I think Joe Mazzula has a really good case, but we expected the Celtics to be good. Everybody expected them to finish first in the Eastern Conference. They've got great continuity, though. Things have changed for them as well, bringing in Jeru Holiday, bringing in Chris Stapps Porzingis, who has been in and out of the lineup this season. Uh, but I think that the Thunder being expected to be a little worse than the Celtics probably puts Mark Dagnall over the top. Yeah, I agree. The, the surprise is always predominant when you're looking at coach of the year it can but i mean those help we keep saying surprise with okc but there was a lot of talk coming into the season about them being really good not this not close to this number one seed for a lot there of the year there's a lot of chatter about them being like a top four team in the west which of course they are play the tape i want to hear that uh, I, I, I don't remember all, them being this good in the chats at all but anyway um Dagnall has been very, very good. Can't wait to see him in his first real postseason. That's going to be interesting for them. Uh, but, yeah, we just talked about most improved player and J-Dub being a part of that. They, they've they helped Dagnall, obviously, but this team plays on both ends. So I I do think he'll he'll win it over a Missoula who's – he's done well, let's be honest. The, when he's been given the keys to this team that Ime Udoka wasn't allowed to coach anymore, people wondered. Can, can this guy do it? And uh, the thing is, he, I don't think he's going to win it just because of it. The team was so freaking good right. before he got the keys. But they gave him the job. Brad Stevens gave him the job because he knew his team was going to believe in him. And they obviously have. I will just say, I don't think the odds difference between Dagnalt with OKC and Finch with the Wolves should be that vast. Right? Because Agreed. last year, Minnesota was 42 and 40. OKC was 40 and 42. They basically had the same record. They played in a play-in game. To get the final spot. Mm. And, and the Wolves crushed them, so they went in, and they you know put up a decent fight against the Nuggets, but they only won one game in that playoff series. So they won a handful more games. Like The expectations were fairly similar, and we were coming in with, I mean, at least I was, with a lot of questions about the Wolves, with the makeup of their team, is Finch the right guy, can can he make this work? And you know they have an identity, of course, that they found that they're the best defense. So I think he deserves some credit. I just think he should be maybe a little higher, and they're still battling for the number one seed. And if they actually get it, you know, without Carl Anthony Towns there over the final yeah. stretch, that'd be pretty impressive. So I just think the odds are a little odd. I think Dagnall will win, and it will be a great winner. And then the final one, uh, you know, it's great. We almost started the show with this, and we're ending with it. Clutch Player of the Year. <laughs> I think the odds flipped last night, because I, when I was making this uh, our, our show and this block last night, I, I saw Steph Curry as the favorite. But as of this morning, DeRozan now, <laughs> minus 165 Curry plus 170, and then Damian Lillard plus 1800. I think SGA and Jokic, you know, have some some um, long odds as well. But did DeRozan win it last night with that <laughs> fadeaway jumper and big overtime performance? You bring up the clutch um, wins for the Bulls. He's a huge part of it. It feels like every game is because of him. Yeah, and Curry did nothing in the clutch last night for the Warriors. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. Well, DeRozan is second in clutch points per game and in total points. Curry is number one. Yeah. DeRozan shoots 52% in the clutch. Curry shoots 49%. But the big difference is that DeRozan is a plus 76 in 166 clutch minutes this season. Steph Curry, a plus three in 122 minutes. Mm. So, I mean, DeRozan is being helped by the Bulls having a really solid defense uh, in clutch time. But his, just like Malik Monk, his points are more important for the Bulls right now because they're actually coming out on top of a lot of these games. Yeah, I'm just looking at the voting from uh, last season, and De'Aaron Fox beat Jimmy Butler and DeMar DeRozan, who was third, mm. who two years ago was the guy that people were looking at as the the spectacle, the guy who hit those back-to-back -back winners on New Year's Eve, and then New Year's Day, he was awesome. Uh, so maybe he wins just because, you know, give him an award that oh, he, he almost a, got. This is like a Robert Downey Jr. award here for him. Eh? <laughs> oh, oh, a respect, a respect. He's yeah. been very good this year, but we're also taking into consideration your previous year's work. I, I'm with you. I think it's still up in the air. Like, Of course, Steph Curry is in theory going to come back here. Could he have a couple huge you know, clutch performances still left in his bag and some game winners? Yes, I mean, yep. it's Steph. So I think this one's still a bit of a toss-up, but DeRozan makes sense to be a, uh, in the lead right now. And over the last... Over the last couple of years, DeRozan is on the short list every year for this because he just takes over, gets to his spot. 
he's money at the line when he gets there generally mm-hmm. <laughs> um so yeah DeRozan is your favorite right now for clutch player of the year but yeah. I thought that'd be fun to look at and, and overall just total points he is second in clutch game points yeah. just to Steph, Steph Curry and then yeah third is way back with Damian Lillard so thanks to John Schumann for putting that together because I'm on NBA.com that's where it all <laughs> happened and that's where De'Aaron Fox uh was awesome last year yeah um, fourth quarter fox 194 clutch points last year and that's why he won the thing uh all right let's get to tweet of the night mm, tweet of the night wow tweet uh tweet of the night comes from at noah dalzell mba who uh informed me at least that jason tatum is publishing a children's book and there it is Tatum uh, wrote, I guess, along with a man named Sam Apple, um, <laughs> Baby Dunks a Lot. <laughs> so this book is coming out in August, I guess, pre-order available now. He said on his Instagram post, and I guess Tatum also tweeted it, Deuce and I read together all the time. So this is something I've loved working on. And it just uh, reminded me, man, there's a lot of NBA players that have written children's books. Yeah. He joins a long list. Uh, Steph Curry has at least two books that he's uh, written or helped write. I Am Extraordinary and I Have a Superpower are Curry's books. Chris Paul, I believe, also has two children's books, Long Shot and Basketball Dreams. I think LeBron has a picture book called I Promise. Uh, Amari Stoudemire's dabbled in the children's literature, as is Ron Artest, as is Carmelo Anthony, and Dennis Rodman. Hey. has a book called Dennis the Wild Bull, which... Uh, have, have you guys read any of these <laughs> uh, books, either yourself or to your kids? The Do only uh, basketball yeah. kids book I remember having, I think it was called B is for Baller. Oh, the ones like... like yeah, like A is for Ali Abdul Jabbar oh, right, or, or that. something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, I've definitely done that one. Um, and then I have read my kids, Dennis Rodman's Bad As I Want to Be. <laughs> Cool. That'd be a fun read. Yeah, that's it's an interesting kids. picture book, especially yeah. the back cover. <laughs> Have you read any of these? Um, I've got to say, I'm an offer on these ones. Okay. Uh, not no, not not a one. It wasn't really on my uh, my bookshelf uh, to read these. But uh, yeah, I think I think they're all. It's something that they should all do. I, I agree. I mean, it f- sounds like there's money in this for first off. So uh, baby uh, dunks you know, a lot. <laughs> um, baby dunks a lot. But we should write a children's book. Something to do with the wedgie. I mean, it just feels and sounds like a, like a, a, a children's book, book right? Mm. Or a picture book of some sort. Mm. Yeah. That's so a good call. Let's start, let's start writing that later today, okay? <laughs> I, I actually like the idea of that. The only other idea I ever had for a kid's book would be called There's a Rumble in My Tumble. And the second line is There's a Toot in My Boot. Okay, this is <laughs> good. It's all about farting. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> but I only could come up with two lines. <laughs> well, we can come up with more. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, definitely. Oh, I love those kids' books. It's just rhyme after rhyme yeah, after totally rhyme. Good. We can do yeah. it. Yeah. And there's, I feel like there's got a lot of books about farts, too, right? Yeah. Because farts are oh, funny. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And you got to make kids feel okay to let embrace it. their to let body it rip. noises. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> but, man, that's actually – a wedgie book is pretty smart because you can, like, tie in, like, everybody's different just like a wedgie. Yeah. Every snowflake is different. Yeah, mm. yeah. Okay, there's something, something there. there. All nice right. Time. Uh, nice you can time. pre-order that tomorrow. We'll have a link for you. <laughs> uh, let's call it there. That was a fun show. Uh, if you're a Survivor fan, join us a little bit later in a few hours for No Buffs, our Survivor recap podcast, breaking down last night's episode. Just uh, hit that link in the show notes. It'll take you to the YouTube page. You can subscribe there or uh, search for No Buffs on Apple, Spotify, wherever you download and listen to pods. Uh, otherwise, we will see you tomorrow for the Drop Podcast. Tomorrow's Friday. It felt like today was Friday. And it also felt like yesterday was Friday, and I have a theory why. The time change, and it's really nice weather here right now. And there's something about good weather that makes me feel like it's the end of the week. Yeah. Right? Mm. Yeah. I think that's what's it's going on. Sunny on. But Fridays. anyways, tomorrow's Friday. <laughs> we'll be here, 10 a.m. Eastern, uh, breaking down tonight's games. I also have a fun idea that I'm going to pitch these guys uh, a little bit later. So. We'll get into rapid fire fun as well. So we'll see you tomorrow. Till then, Clipper Bros. You heard it here first. Have a great time. Turn up. Love you guys. Awesome. Thanks for joining us. And remember, Rudy Gobert said you shouldn't gamble, but listen to this. He didn't really say that, but he kind of said that. Anyway, listen to these potential lines. 
It's all about Ben Simmons. Will Ben Simmons retire before the start of the season? You can gamble on that. Will Ben Simmons play game one of next season? Just period. Yeah. Will Ben Simmons be on the Nets roster next season? You can ga- gamble on anything. Jesus. Don't gamble. But not on Ben Simmons. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could say no. You could say, you could say no. Yeah. That's probably the smarter bet. Brace the day, people.